So our last speaker for today is Christoph Schweiger, who will speak about uh, TV theories with defects and representation oh. theory. Okay, thank you very much. And thank you very much to the organizers for this uh, invitation. But you should have taken the effort to adapt the weather to Hamburg standards. So, um, in any case, I want to give you some rough overview of what we've been interested in recently. And TFTs are in this context always three dimensional oriented TFTs. I will talk both about TFTs of specialty to hive type and as a special case spec uh, specified later on to TFTs of to hive bureau type. Um, I won't have much time to explain to our motivation, but let me state it nonetheless. So what we are doing here is actually in our case um, uh, motivated by certain considerations in two dimensional conformal field theories, but that's not anything I could explain today. It has indeed applications to uh, systems in solid state physics, and we are getting active questions from people working in this field. And um, for me, the main motivation at the moment is uh, the interplay with certain results and structures in representation theory. Now, it's a classical definition that the TFT, in the simplest case, is a symmetric monoidal functor from a category of cobordisms to a category, um, to an algebraic category, so in our case, in the simplest case, it's really complex vector spaces. Now, um, if you allow all manifolds to be oriented, <laughs> now the idea is that let's allow for a larger category of cobordism where, and let's do as a warm up two dimensional TFTs, where objects are not simply disjoint unions of oriented circles, but where we allow as an additional object for an interval. Now, if you have an interval, uh, you expect to have boundary conditions. Let's assume naively that there is a certain set of boundary conditions. And let's try to determine what boundary conditions could be if you know what the TFT does on the circle. And all I'm telling you now as a warm-up is known for roughly 10 years or even a bit more. So the TFT should assign to this new object the interval with the same boundary condition, a vector space. And if you now take this cobordism ingoing, ingoing to outgoing, you get a map from the vector space, tensor the vector space to itself. So you get an algebra. You get an associative algebra, you get even a bit more, you get the structure of the Frobenius algebra, but it turns out that this Frobenius algebra is not any more symmetric because here really topologically we have a disk and three points on the disk and just the cyclic ordering exists and no commutativity. And if you go through the same type of analysis, you find out that suppose we have found such an algebra for one boundary condition, then any other boundary condition leads by considering an interval with mixed boundary condition to a vector space which has the structure of a module over this not necessarily commutative for previous algebra. And if you go through the analysis, then you see this is described by a module, this is described by a module, and this vector space is actually the space of uh, intertwiners, it's the space of algebra map, uh, of, of maps of modules from V1 to V2, and the algebras here, and the, uh, the algebras we uh, type for different um, boundary conditions, they are all more of an equivalent, and the commutative algebra we get for the circle is the center. So this is not new. And what I want to do is kind of present an analogy of these structures in three dimensions. Now, to have a concrete check, I'm using a specific class of derived real models. I'm using die path witten theories. And let me extend them. Let, let me introduce them. And let's start by taking a closed-oriented three-manifold and define group G. Now, here you see that um, Defining an invariant of a three manifold is easy. Let's take um, the following perspective. Let's take as 
the space of uh, field configurations Let's take all G bundles, G principal bundles on N. Let's define a groupoid. And let's take as an action, uh, let's take simply zero to have a topological field theory. Then I have to count a groupoid. And for counting the elements in a groupoid, there's a good notion. Groupoid cardinality. What is groupoid cardinality? Groupoid cardinality is take sum over all isoclasses of objects and weight them by the automorphism groups. That's how we usually count objects with automorphism groups in mathematics or physics. You mean, you mean inverse? And divide by the, yes, right. Weight by the inverse of, yeah. Thank you. So that's, uh, that's a good notion of cardinality. So we have a three manifold invariant that's almost trivial as a statement, what's more non-trivial is that you can extend them to two-dimensional manifolds as follows. Uh, namely, suppose we have now a closed-oriented two-manifolds and we are given a three-manifold with boundary sigma. Then, what do we get in this situation? If we have a bundle on the boundary, we can extend it to a bundle, a G bundle, on the three manifold, which restricts on the boundary to a given, um, to this given bundle P, and then we get a groupoid of bundles which have a prescribed restriction to the boundary. We can count this groupoid because that's what we do all the time with groupoids of bundles on three manifolds. That's a number, so we get a function on the bundles on the boundary, and. What should we assign to the boundary? Well, that should be the recipient for this. Uh, the, uh, this is the vector space that is generated by isoclasses of G bundles. And so this is a natural way to get a vector space. You get a T of T from these two gadgets, but uh, for later purposes, it will be quite convenient to play the game again because a two-manifold is still pretty complicated. You can cut a two-manifold by doing a pair of pants decomposition. So let's suppose we have a one manifold and that the, um, we have a two manifold whose boundary is the one manifold. What do we do? Well, we assign to every bundle the vector space we assign to a two manifold. So we assign the vector space generated by the isoclasses of G bundles that restrict on, uh, to P. Um, on the boundary. Well, in this situation we get a function on the space of G bundles on S, so we assign to the one manifold the space of vector bundles. And the space of vector bundles is a category. So we assign to a one manifold um, the space of functors from the category of G bundles on S with values in vect, that's a discrete description of the space of vector bundles. So we get to a uh, setup where we assign to a three manifold, a closed oriented three manifold a number, to a two manifold a vector space, and to a one manifold a category. That's what people call a three to one extended T of T. And if we have, so formally what we get is we now work in a setup that's extended as compared to um, Atiyah's original definition, we work with a geometric category, which is a body category. So it has as objects closed oriented one manifold, so circles. It has as one morphisms uh, surfaces with boundaries. So this is a one morphism from two circles to a single circle which I can draw alternatively in this way. These are the two ingoing circles. This is the outgoing circle. And the two morphisms are three manifolds with corners. So you see here, I take the two manifold here. I take the two manifold here. The three manifold is this tin with uh, pipes inside. This looks like a braiding. This is not a coincidence, of course. And here, in the target, we need a symmetric monoidal bi-category. And the one we take is a uh, subversion of two vector spaces. And let's take finitely semi simple, so C linear A being categories. So these are categories which have a finite number of isoclasses. 
and then you can evaluate the functor. It gives for the circle a category. It gives for the pair of pens a functor, so, um, which will become a tensor product in a moment. And the three manifolds, they give, for example, here from this functor given by the pair of pens, and this functor with opposite order of taking the tensor product, it gives a natural transformation. And that's uh, a braiding. And in this way, you end up at a picture where by evaluating a TFT in this definition, you get um, a category with additional structure. And conversely, what's known for much longer time, you get from a category with a nice structure such as TFT. Now, here, um, I want to go back to the dyke witten series for a moment. So how can you construct it now in a very systematic way? If you go back to our picture of manifolds, this here is a cobordism. A cobordism is really a span of manifolds. And a manifold with corner is a span of spans. So what we can do is we take our factor of taking G bundles to go to span of groupoids and then we linearize. And I should emphasize that linearizing is uh, um, you're just taking functors into VECT. So that's a thing that's um, in the first approximation independent from what I'm doing here. I don't have too many choices here. But uh, later on, we will see sometimes you have to linearize in a projective way and you have to get the approximate two cosines. Okay. So now let's do a little cal calculation just to do something explicit. Let's take our dive up written theories. So we have to take G bundles on S1 and linearize G bundles on S1. Everybody knows they are determined by holonomy up to conjugation. So really this bundle is equivalent to holonomy up to conjugation. That's an action groupoid. And you have to take functors into VEC. So to any group element, you assign a vector space and uh, to you have an adjoint action over it and that's exactly a trim type double. So you have a G equivariant vector bundle on G or put differently what you get as a category is the Trinfeld center, it's the Trinfeld center of um, the category of G graded vector spaces. One of the things that's probably um, uh, clear to everybody in this audience, but let me just recall it since we talk about Trinfeld centers, is if you talk about the center of an associative algebra, uh, then you impose a condition. But for the Trinfeld center, you do something which is slightly different. So the object for the Trinfeld center is an object in your monoidal category and structure, namely a half braid. And that will make a crucial difference in a moment in our analysis of um, uh, boundary conditions and surface defects. So let me recall a few facts for the Trinfeld center. Um, so here you are adding a half braiding. Indeed, the Trinfeld center is braided. You can forget the half braiding, so you get the forgetful functor that's monoidal. And finally, um, if C is braided already, then of course you can take an object here and take its braiding as the half braiding and in this way embed the category into the Trinfeld center. If you have the braiding, you have also the opposite braiding. So you get the second uh, embedding from the opposite braiding to the Trinfeld center and the two give an embedding of C to the linear product, C with the opposite braiding into C. And one nice definition of being modular is the fact that this here is a braided equivalent. It's a nice definition of modular. It's not the original, but um, it's, it will be important in a moment. What's the equivalence of C in this case? C braided. No finiteness essentially. Oh, yeah. If I want to use the word modular, I should say a finitely semi-simple Right, category is uh, modular, and I'm cheating a little bit, um, and also by saying that I should say here it is non-degenerately braiding, and I'm a little bit sloppy here with the twist as opposed to 
um, creating a, a without a twist. So now let's go to a three dimensional TFT of a Shetiki Torah type and let's try to determine what could be defects and instead of defects let's try to determine how to describe boundary conditions. First, first in a sense, uh, a boundary condition is the biggest defect, it separates the theory from nothing. So, um, or from the modular tensor category uh, vect, a finite dimension complex vector spaces. Now, in this case, we expect the following structure. We expect to find a certain bi-category, which I want to describe, given a modular tensor category in the interior. Its objects should be boundary conditions. Now, if I'm given boundary conditions, there should be Wilson lines that are inside the boundary and they have a certain type, so there are types of Wilson lines, and they might also separate different boundary conditions, and then there might be point-like insertions on the Wilson lines, and that's um, setting up a structure of objects, one morphism and two morphisms, and if you take the Poincaré dual of this picture, then you see it uh, by categories in a more familiar setting. So let's try Given a modular tensor category, let's find a nice bi-category of boundary conditions. That's uh, my task. And really, I'm not doing mathematics for the moment, but I'm trying to find a reasonable definition for mathematics. And that's a usual thing. If you do boundary conditions, you cannot impose anything, and it won't be an interesting set of boundary conditions. It's about determining an interesting set of boundary conditions. So, the central idea is to consider the following thing. Take a Wilson line in the bulk and assume that you can move it to the boundary and assume that you can do it in, in a way that is as nice as possible. And I'm describing now what as nice as possible means. Now, Wilson lines here are braided. But if a Wilson line is confined to the boundary, there is no braiding inside the two-dimensional surface. So here, this category of Wilson lines here is not braided. Now, let's assume that this functor is maximally compatible with fusion of Wilson lines. So take two Wilson lines in the bulk. So here this is just a two-dimensional cut. It shouldn't make a difference whether you are fusing them in the bulk and moving them to the boundary or whether you are moving the two in the boundary and you are fusing. And it shouldn't make a difference means that this functor here I'm trying to determine as a description of the boundary condition. Um, well, it has the property that these two things are equal, but they are coherently isomorphic, so Fa should be a monoidal function. This is the first thing. Now, assume that if you take a Wilson line in the bulk and you move it to the boundary and you fuse inside the boundary, it doesn't make a difference whether uh, you do it from the right or from the left. So for any x in the boundary and any u from the bulk, this should be coherently isomorphic. So this is a categorification of saying that f of u is in the center, but recall this is structure, this is not a property. Okay, so there is a definition which achieves this because these data are equivalent to the fact of saying that we have for this functor f a lift to the Trinfeld center. This is the forgetful functor from the Trinfeld center which forgets the half braiding. So it means that for every object here we get, we have in addition a choice for half braiding because a half braiding switches these two. And this is the notion of a central functor uh, which has been introduced uh, independently for different reasons. And now comes a fact. Look, the only reason why there should be a rule how to deter how you can exchange two Wilson lines in the boundary, like this here, is the fact that this Wilson line in the boundary comes from the bulk. Otherwise, there shouldn't be a rule. So, put differently, if um, 
this functor here to the Trinfeld center, if something has a rule to be interchanged, it comes from the bulb, it should be essentially subjective. You go on, you, you analyze this not only for object but also for morphisms, and then you find it should be a bijections on home spaces, so it should be an equivalent. So now you realize this is not an innocent analysis because I mean, if you think about a braided category as the analog of a commutative algebra, yeah, any commutative algebra is the center of something. I mean, it's the center of itself. But a braided category is not necessarily the Trinfeld center of something. Um, there's, rather, there is an obstruction. And this obstruction, this is work of David of uh, Möger, Nick, Schisch, and Ostrich, um, has led to the following notion of a big group. So, two modular tensor categories are called width equivalent if they are braided equivalent after stabilizing here with Trinfeld centers. And uh, this gives a, a nice group structure. You have to prove a little bit to show that it is a group structure and it contains a classical object, namely the width group of finite AB groups with a um, quadratic form. So, now, you, you see that here, um, a boundary condition can only exist if the modular tensor category is trivial in the bit group. So there is no obstruction. Now, how to find other boundary conditions? I promised to find the by category. Suppose you have found one of them, leading to a fusion category WA, then you want to determine a category of mixed fusion lines. And because you can fuse this here, you see that this category has the structure of something which looks like a module. And in fact, there is a notion of a module category, very much like a monoid category is a categorification of a ring. This is a categorification of a module. And in this way, so a module category over the monoidal category is a category with a bifunctor and associativity becomes constraints, very much like associativity of the fusion category and their coherence conditions. So what we get here is a bi-category and the boundary conditions are just given by the boundary. Um, um, uh, by the bi-category of uh, module categories over one of these fusion categories. And in this way, you can compute also the other um, categories in question. So let me show you one thing which is non-trivial and which is a check on this whole picture. Namely, if, you're, if you look what are the Wilson lines that separate a fusion category WB from itself, then it should be computed by the category of endo functors of a module category. On the other hand, I explained to you that this category, if you take the Trinfeld center, it should be the original monoidal category. And there is a theorem which dates back some uh, 16 years by now, um, by Schaunburg, who says that if you go to the endo functors of a module category, then this is braided equivalent to the category of um, to the Trinfeld center. Of course, you are realizing what's going on here. Um, this is really um, something that takes place in the two Morita theory. And um, uh, I'm choosing a description which breaks Morita invariance because otherwise I would have to work not with bi categories but higher categories. Okay, so. If you want to describe boundary conditions, find one boundary condition which has the property that C is braided, one fusion category such that C is braided equivalent to the fusion category, and then you can find all other categories in the game, like for example this category of mixed boundary conditions by doing functor categories. Now, there is a small word of warning, so if you have equivalence here, then you have to forget full factor. So the modules here, they are necessary. They are by pull back. They are also module categories over C, but boundary conditions are not described by 
uh, the, um, uh, by module categories over the modular category, but rather by mod module categories over one of these trivializations. And that's now instructive if you go to Tuval Vero theories, we know by work by people present here that Tuval Vero theories are actually a very ticking Tuval theories based on the Trinfeld center. So here we have a fusion category which trivializes uh, the whole thing. And um, then we can describe boundary conditions by um, module categories over the fusion category. If you do this in the specific case of the two graded vector spaces, that's what people call it, uh, guitar historic code, then you have two module categories over the two graded vector spaces, which fits <coughs> results obtained in other frameworks, but over the trim file center you would have six vector module categories and that's too much. So this is really check that this picture is correct. Well, Let's go a little bit further because I will need it in the second part of the talk. Um, here, let's assume that we don't have a boundary, but we have a surface defect which separates two TFTs, one to a modular tensor category C1, one to a modular tensor category C2. Then those lines uh, confined to a surface. They are not braided because inside the surface you can't braid. And an analysis similar to the one we had shows that in this case, um, the difference of these two modular tensor categories. So C1 box times the linear product, which the, the one with reverse trading has to be with trivial, has to be a trivial center. So these interfaces don't exist between different uh, the TFTs of the uh, to type, they only exist if they are in the same bit class. Yeah, so, of course, if you are in to type Vero, then um, the bit class is trivial by definition when this obstruction vanishes. <coughs> so this is the obstruction here. And let me recall one thing now. If C is modular, we know by what I've explained in, in the beginning, that C box times C ref is a Trinfeld center, and the Trinfeld center of C itself. So there is a canonical trivialization. There is a distinguished defect uh, separating C from itself, and that's a transparent defect. It's a defect you don't see. Wilson lines inside this transparent defect are the ordinary Wilson lines you find, uh, well, we know for 30 years. Yeah. Okay, so. I'm skipping these remarks about applications. There are nice applications also to quantum codes, which I don't want to explain today. Okay, so now I want to use this in the specific class of dike up series and put together the general theory and an explicit realization of dike up <coughs> theories to recover a result from representation theory. That's the first result I, I want to recover. So now let's complicate the picture. And let's include in dike buff witten theory a three-co-cycle. Well, it's a three-co-cycle in group cohomology with values in C star. And let's think about it by a use of language of a three-co-cycle in groupoid cohomology for the trivial groupoid. Now, a physical way to think about this is this is a topological Lagrangian because this groupoid is equivalent to the stack Bun G, and you have here a two jerk, a turn dynamics jerk. That's really the background to think about in the physical way. Now, in order to take this here and to do a twisted linearization, we have to transgress to a two code chain on the relevant groupoid here. And this groupoid, which I've led in linearization to G graded vector spaces with an adjoint action, well, this is a loop groupoid. Take this as a replacement for S1, that's the fundamental group of S1, that's bundles over it, so it's really taking the loops. And how do you go to loops? You transgress, and there's an explicit description. So take here your object, here take um, gauge transformations, then you get a piece of cake. Now, 
cut the piece of cake into triangles. Um, if you cut them into triangles, you get tetrahedra, uh, sorry, into tetrahedra, and to tetrahedra you can associate very easily um, numbers using uh, the three cosine. So here in this case you get three numbers, and that's exactly the transgression, and it gives to you um, the cosine or the twisted print for double, you know, from work of Dijkstra, Pasky, and Roche for 25 years or even more. Now, let's include the effects in a gauge theoretic way. And the appropriate way to do this, and that's clear, I think, to everybody who has thought about boundary conditions in gauge theories, is the following one. Think about y as um, the boundary of x, but in fact, I could take any morphism of manifolds and take a group homomorphism. And let's now define a relative version of bundle. By the way, that's already in Steenrod's book. So what's this? This is a G bundle on X. This is an H bundle on the manifold. And there is a comparison. Then you can take the G bundle on the big space, restrict it, and you can induce the H bundle. And then you get two G bundles on Y. And with the additional data is an isomorph. That's, um, now, you can use this type of idea to compute categories for one manifold. And let's take as an example uh, for an interval where you have a boundary, a boundary, and a defect in the interior. Now, what do you have to, to fix? You have to fix your groups for the intervals. You have to fix uh, subgroups for the boundaries. And you have to fix a subgroup of the uh, Cartesian product of groups for the defect. Now you evaluate what are the bundles on it. Bundles over intervals and bundles over coin strip is a pretty boring thing. So the only thing that survives is really um, an isomorphism <coughs> of G bundles, but isomorphisms of G bundles over a point are group elements. So in this way, you get just a bunch of group elements modulo the gauge action from this interval and this interval, and modulo the gauge action on H1, H2, and H2. So this groupoid is pretty straightforward. Now, you, need, you fix your additional group cohomology data. So you fix um, the, the topological Lagrangian, the three cosine, and on the boundary, you fix something that's very familiar to everybody who has worked on deep brain. So Anton should know it from a long time ago. But now we are not working uh, to one, but three, two. So everything is shifted one dimension up. You fix a code chain such that the derivative equals the restriction. Also, this is a gauge theoretically quite natural thing. You feed in this thing. You cook up the prescription for transgression, which actually gives a two cycle here. And you get, by linearizing, in a projective way, a category. A C linear category. And on the other hand, we know that this should be a module category over the appropriate um, uh, fusion category. This is, in our case, this is G-graded vector spaces with the associator twisted. Well, here, the module categories over Fusion categories have been classified by Ostrick, and he has also computed um, here the, the functor category. And it turns out that for any choice of omega, theta 1, and theta 2, that these functor categories and the geometrically computed things are equal. So this is, you can now debate whether this is a confirmation. Uh, like the theoretic ways of our ansatz to take module categories, so you can say it provides an understanding of Austin's classification of module categories. It's up to you how to <coughs> interpret this fact. Now, in the last part, I want to do the following thing. If you are given co-dimension one defects, there is a very important insight. Co-dimension one defects, topological defects that are invertible, they are related to symmetry. So let's use this to understand something about symmetries of three-dimensional fields. Okay. Now, so topological. So let me explain this idea that invertible topological co-dimension one defects are related to symmetries in two dimensions. That's because I can draw better in two dimensions. 
And everything I'm stating here in pictures is actually a theorem if you apply it to two-dimensional rational CFTs. Yeah. So, so suppose you, uh, we are given a four-point correlator to be concrete. Then I can insert a little co-dimension one defect, which here in this case is a line defect. It has quantum dimension one, so inserting such a loop doesn't cost anything. Now, I'm doing a contour deformation trick. Um, because this behaves like a branch. I think I had to end up the wrong piece of chalk. So let me take this. So I take this little piece. Here are my insertions. Here's my little defect. And I'm now putting it in such a way that it goes here. I didn't change it topologically. Now you see that here I have the situation that I have two lines of this defect, but it's invertible, so the tensor product here contains just a monoidal unit. So as an exact identity in correlators, I can draw it in this way. If I draw it in this way, you see that I'm getting this identity. So what starts to happen is that these defects start to encircle the insertions, these become effectively other, other insertions, so you have an action on insertions, and um, it is, the correlator didn't change, so there's a good reason to call it a symmetry. And it's even better, if there would be a boundary, then by the same trick, some part of the defect would stick to the boundary, and in this way, you know how to act on all field theoretic data, not just insertions, but boundaries, surface defects, and so on. That's important if you want to really call it a symmetry of the field theory. Now, here, for three-dimensional TFTs, um, and let's go to the to Ralph Vero case, um, what we should do is we should take invertible A bimodule categories. Well, bimodules over an algebra and monodal category, so it makes sense to say that they are Invertible bimodule categories are monoidal bi category, so it makes sense to say what they are that they are invertible. So in this way, you get something which is called the power Picard group. And let me simplify things by working only with isomorphism classes of bimodule categories so that I have an actual group. Yeah. But really it's a higher categorical gadget, and the claim is that this categorical two group is the true symmetry structure of the DTFTs of the right level type. Now, let's compare this to some development which is a purely representation theoretic development. Let's take a fusion category and let's take a bimodule category over it. Now, if I'm given uh, an, an object in the fusion category, then I can tensor from the right, and this gives a C linear functor on the bimodule category. And similarly, tensoring from the left <coughs> gives a, uh, a C linear functor as well. Now, the half if I assume that this is not just an object in A, but in the Trinfeld center, I have a half braiding. And the half braiding uh, endows these functors with a better structure, it endows this with the functor of uh, the structure of left module, uh, um, of, of bi module functors. So let me explain this. What is a bi module functor? So, for example, if I want to do RA, this is my RA of E, I have to show that this is compatible with tensoring with any element of A from the right. So let me take any element A prime from the right, and I have to show that this is isomorphic, or I have to give an isomorphism to Ra of B tensored with A prime. If you go to the definition, this is B tensor A tensor A prime, and this is B tensor A prime tensor A, and you see you have to switch the two, but that's exactly done by a half brain. Yeah. So we really go into bimodule functors, and now there is uh, there is a, a result by Ettinghoff, Nikrish, Ostrich, which says that um, if 
the, the bimodule category is invertible, these two factors are equivalences. So we have in this case an equivalence to the bimodule endomorphisms of B, and if we concatenate them, we get an endofunctor from Z A to Z A. You check that it's even a braided autoequivalence. And they show that this um, um, way of associating to an invertible bimodule a braided equivalence is an isomorphism. From the point of view of representation theory, this is quite interesting because our Picard groups are hard. Computing braided equivalences are, is, uh, at least in certain cases, it's, it's uh, definitely easier. And I will go to such a case at the end. Well, now, what is the TFT counterpart to this construction? Well, if nobody has constructed um, to have real TFT with defects completely so far, but if it exists, there should be a factor assigned to a cylinder where on this circle of the cylinder I'm wrapping uh, such a defect. And it should be a functor from the category assigned to bulk fields and lines to itself. And by using axioms of a TFT, you can show that this functor, if D is invertible, should be a braided equivalence. Now here the TFT, this becomes a very non-trivial statement, this isomorphic of adding of nutrition oster, because you just keep here the information of how the symmetry acts on bulk fields and lines, and this is enough to determine what the symmetry is. This is non-trivial, and this gives an interpretation of a, a representation theoretic result in terms of um, topological field theory. And of course, you realize that this construction is just a bigger part of TFT with defects. Well, now, let's do, to conclude an example, um, let's do Let's compute the symmetries for a billion diagraph written series. So in this case, we take G a finite a billion group. We simplify lives by choosing the co-cycle, the free co-cycle to be trivial. In this case, well, the Trinfeld double is particularly simple because uh, conjugation action is quite trivial. So it is the simple objects are just given by a group element and an irreducible representation sitting on this group element. Okay? So you have to respect the structure. The braiding is actually encoded here in a quadratic form. That's the nice thing about braiding for these uh, theories. And there's a canonical quadratic form on a being group plus its character group, which is evaluated character on the group element. Okay? And it has to respect the braiding. So it is the group of those uh, automorphism of A plus A dual, which respect the quadratic form. That's a computation of a power of the card group. And let's understand this group in terms of symmetries of the field theory. And they're kind of obvious symmetries. For example, if you're given an automorphism of A, of the finite abelian group, then uh, you can find um, a corresponding defect. Well, the defect will be described by a subgroup, the subgroup of A plus A, which of course our description of defects, and it's just a graph of the symmetry. You compute how it acts, that can be computed using gauge theoretical tools, and you find the braided equivalence you expect. And if you remember that A, automorphisms of A, that's the automorphisms of the group with um, with one object and just A as morphism, so it's the automorphism of the stack of A bundles. So it's really the natural kinematical symmetries. If you think about these theories as sigma models with the target space full A. Well, now there should be more because here, this here is trivial, but even though it's trivial, we have a transcendence term over this uh, target space. Now. Uh, what are the endomorphisms of a trivial transcendence two jerk? It's almost by definition uh, it is a one jerk. So that's how you construct two jerk. So it should be what physicists call maybe a B field. So it is an alternating, if you go through the formalism, it is an alternating bihomomorphism on the A B group. And 
Again, you can determine what the subgroup is, and in this case, it's important to take the um, particular cohomological data, and you find explicitly how it acts on graded equipments. Okay, you have a couple of generators, symmetries of your target, symmetries or the morphisms of the germs against two jerks sitting on your target, and they are not sufficient to spend it. But there's more, there's more that's, that's known, namely, there should be electric magnetic dualities, namely. Suppose, um, let's simplify life, let's assume A is cyclic. Then, I mean, any finite abelian group is isomorphic to its due character group, although not canonically so. Let's fix a group isomorphism. That gives trivially the braided equivalence. Well, uh, if, in general, if you have a, um, a group that's not cyclic, then any direct summand in it can, can be used to uh, do something which uh, is called a partial electric magnetic duality. Okay? And again, you can describe them perfectly in terms of defects. Well, once you've done this, uh, you have a set of generators, and you sit down, and you show that these symmetries form a set of generators. So this is a proof that for dikebach witten theories based on a finite abelian group, that's a specific class of Kovac-Biot theories, everything is generated by symmetries of the target space, symmetries of the transcendence uh, to jerk on it, plus these electric magnetic qualities. So that gives a clear, and these are actual symmetries because they come from defects, they act on everything we want to have in the field theory. Well, let me conclude. So the first thing is, I think, having defects of various co-dimensions in the game is a really natural structure in any quantum field theory. So um, they are particularly amenable in topological field theory. Um, they have plenty of applications, so for example, the theories living on co-dimension one defects are a nice way to describe anomalous um, uh, theories. They have applications to actual defects in real life systems. They allow you to get some insight into structures that people have found in representation theory. They give you a clear way to realize symmetries of topological field theories and to find that the power Picard proofs are actually the symmetries of um, TFTs of Toral Bureau type. This whole analysis isn't pushed at the moment for a Higgin uh, for reasons that are probably obvious to everybody because then you have to cope with this um, obstruction in the bit proof and that the analysis becomes much more involved. Okay, let me stop it. Please, questions, remarks. We have time. In, in, in the example that you looked at in the, the end of the talk, so you, you gave a set of generators, but is there a nice way to present a general uh, kind of composition of those uh, possible generators, right? You probably don't, is there a way to, to give like general answers for the uh, transformation? which is a symmetry, well, without splitting it into uh, Well, actually, this behaves very much like uh, uh, at the end pair, in the theory of finite groups. Mm -hmm. And um, um, so you are roughly as good or as bad as in the theory of the end pairs. Mm -hmm. The theory, uh, it's not completely <coughs> natural to write down a general formula for the general argument. And you see, if you start to drop to go to a non abelian group or to turn on a thick cycle, then the structure becomes much more involved and um, really you're going farther up, uh, you're much more remote in the structure even from the end. And so um, here it's just about generators and it kind of tells you that you get all symmetries by taking the symmetries you may expect. It's not true anymore, by the way, for non abelian. 
Can you say something, anything about the digital and serious in high resolution? Is there any insight into that? Well, what I'm saying is a, a weak statement, but I think it has some importance. Um, whenever you have a notion of a topological codimension one defect, um, it should describe symmetries. That part of the picture is pretty uh, stable, and it should act always in the way you expect it to act. You're inserting a little bubble of your defect. It shouldn't, if it's really topological and invertible, this shouldn't change the correlator. And then you start to wrap up everything in the, in the theory. You're wrapping up insertions. You're wrapping up lower codimension defects, and that gives an action. How this looks explicitly, well, you need, of course, a very well-developed formalism of how to deal with the field theory in itself. And we can make it concrete for the moment in three-dimensional TFTs, because there's a lot of mathematically precise structure available, and in two-dimensional rational CFTs. And the fact that it works for CFTs as well as at least a certain mathematical confirmation that the picture is stable. So, is there a normal question? Like